Tina Cartwright uh, was the state climatologist of West Virginia. You bet you didn't know we had a state climatologist, did you? I had a friend who used to be the state bee inspector. Now that was a nice job. Bardwell, Bard, well, he traveled all over the state doing these beards with his bees. And <laughs> it's nice when a state has uh, people with specialized knowledge who uh, work for the benefit of the people. Um, Tina can talk a little bit about her uh, professional background. We've got it listed in some of the stuff, but at the moment you're working as a teacher, correct? Right there, I have it. Oh, here it is. Here's her, here's her, here's her background. I don't need to say anything about it then. Come on in, everybody. We're going to start out by hearing from uh, Tina Cartwright. We're going to hear from three people who are in the classroom working with students every day who understand who, you know, who just have forgotten more about how people feel and react about the science of climate change than and probably most of us will ever knew, ever, uh, and have made lots of mistakes, I think, and can talk us through some of those mistakes and what they've learned. Uh, and then hopefully will tell us a little bit, too, about what, what they still want to know, what, they, what they're still uh, struggling with as they pursue this. You know, I thought this whole program, in a way, especially I'll say this for the non-white-haired folks who aren't in my old co cohort here, uh, this, is a, this, this, this program is a little bit of a job fair. Uh, not that we're hiring, yeah, but not that we're hiring, but that these people who are speaking, who are in the academy, many of them, but, or in the school systems, um, that they're modeling careers. Climate change, as I say, it's not going away. It's a growth industry, if anything. And there are opportunities for people with all kinds of professional and personal leanings. I don't care whether they're banjo players or apiarists or climatologists to, to participate. And what we're trying to do is highlight a lot of different opportunities that there are to, to work in the climate field. The best way to highlight that is that have folks up here who are going to uh, model it. So let's uh, welcome Tina. Thank you. Welcome everyone back at back of the break. I just wanted to give a little background information because I am a West Virginia native, um, first generation college student. Had the pleasure of attending West Virginia University. You might have heard of it. Um, and I highlighted the really the most two important words on the slide, and it's because I participated as a Goldwater Scholar in undergraduate research that really expanded my horizon in terms of thinking, hmm, PhD, that may be something I could do, because that was for sure not, I'm from Charleston area in between Charleston and Huntington, and so I knew no one doing that kind of academic research um, or working at a university. Um, I knew I was interested in the weather. I did a seventh grade science fair project, actually, on the weather, using current clouds to predict future weather. That is kind of a thing when you have a front coming through. But otherwise, the data doesn't really show a lot of trends there. Um, but it, it involved me going to the National Weather Service, and I've always liked technology. You know, I was the kid that would tear apart the pin during church, right? Church gets boring. So you find ways to distract yourself. And, um, and so I was always interested in technology, and so I was enamored by the radar. And, and also, I, I wasn't afraid to, as I was doing in the hallway, going upstream, right? Being the kid who was telling the answer a little different than everyone else, right? What do you want to be when you grow, grow up? And so I said, from the age of about 12, I wanted to be a meteorologist. Um, and so I, I pathed that out, even through WVU. Um, I always tell my students now that I wrote letters. You remember the ones with stamps, right? To other colleges and universities to try to duplicate a program, um, at least the, the prerequisites to go to graduate school in meteorology. And Ken Martis, I have to say wonderful things about my advisor in the geography department here at WVU, was super supportive um, in that um, in that goal and that quest, and so it ended up. I received my doctorate in meteorology, but at that time I was becoming more and more involved in science education and outreach, and coming back home to West Virginia. Um, and so I didn't know really what that meant career-wise, uh, but I knew I had kids and I wanted them to be here, and I wanted my family to help me support um, help support me raising them. 
And so we moved back to home to West Virginia, and I started working at State uh, to try to build a meteorology program um, in, um, at West Virginia State. And that turned into working more and more with teachers and outreach. Um, and now I find myself at um, doing science education full time um, at Marshall University. And so this area of research that I have developed over the last decade or so is really me trying to bridge the gap between I was trained as a meteorologist, but now I do science education. So I'm really curious about how our home climate, right, our sensitivity to sort of seasonal variations impacts our understanding or belief in climate change and climate variability. Um, and so that's what I'll talk a little bit more um, later. This distinction between current weather, right, and long-term climate impacts is really hard for our mental mind to make, right? Um, there's been a fair amount of research, and I'll talk a little bit about it, um, about understanding of geologic time and geologic time scale. Our, our brain can't handle that. And particularly when we start teaching about this in the middle school level, are you kidding me, right? A week from now is forever uh, when you're 12, right? Um, so they, last summer was, oh, so long ago. So we're talking about really long timescales in geologic time frames, but in meteorology, we start to talk that way as well when we talk about climate and climate variability and climate impacts. Oops. <clears throat> and so we really are focused on that it's a conceptualization issue uh, as much as well as understanding or politics. It's really hard for our students and some adults uh, to conceptualize this and find a distinguishing factor between a snowstorm, right, and climate change. And, and we, I prefer climate change because we're talking about precipitation pattern shifts, which are really going to impact our survivability on this planet. Um, and so I'm interested in also in terms of the sensitivity that we're sort of grown up. We live in the mid latitudes, right? We have big swings between summer and winter. So what's a few degrees in warming? Whereas you, if you live in some of these places that later people are gonna talk about in the Arctic and in the, in the tropical regions, they are niche climate and they have very small variability from season to season. And so they have a different perception of risk associated with a warming trend. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit, um, I have a, a movie, uh, it's a documentary that I'll kind of feature again at the end of the talk called The, the Anthropologist as another mechanism to communicate this issue. Um, and so I wanted to bring to you sort of this evolution of student expectations with our standards. So West Virginia recently adapted, and I'll come back to that as well, um, the next generation science standards. Um, these came into effect in 2016 and were adopted by our K-12 school system. And you can kind of see here, these are the evolution of what's expected in grade five, grade eight, and by grade 12. Um, and you can kind of, these are the sort of the phrases that come to, um, that are related back to weather versus climate and understanding the complex um, issues associated with climate change. So if we look at this more detailed in terms of the exact language of um, the expectations uh, for our students and for our teachers to deliver to the students, you can see that it begins in kindergarten. Um, and that's what the K stands for at the first letter. So K is kindergarten. Um, then we can see th third grade, three, and then middle school is the MS. Um, and then there on the right-hand side, um, the climate starts a little bit later and extends through high school. The HS is through the high school. Um, and so by ultimately by high school, we're hoping that students have engaged in understanding how climate has been influenced by human activity, right? So my research has been really focused on that middle level student understanding, um, ages 13 to 15, because prior to NGSS, that's where they were getting it. There was no, nothing else, right? Nothing else in the standards related to climate and or weather um, and the high, at the high school level. Um, and so it was really falling to our middle school educators. Um, and so my work, I was, um, had the opportunity to build on a published work from Boone, and she looked at Australian and UK students at the same age at very different time frames in 1991 and 2001. And this was the sample, I, I, I'll present some of my work that I took place in 2011 uh, with follow-up 
to those same students in 2015 when they were in high school in terms of how did their understanding change or, or perceptions change about climate. And so that's what I kind of sort of outline here in sort of a three-phase approach. Um, phase one, uh, comparing instantaneous 2011 students with Boone students in 1991 and 2001. Um, and then I was able to follow up with these same students in high school um, in 2015. And then now I'm beginning really to look at the student understanding after our implementation of the next generation science standards. Um, so I sampled um, students, again, that were in middle school prior to the NGSS implementation, and then they've just, again, did the survey um, as ninth graders after experiencing our middle school curriculum. And I hope to follow up again with them um, when they are seniors as well. So th this is a sort of a snapshot of a few answers uh, to the survey that myself and Boone, using her work, um, developed. And so for me, fundamentally, greenhouse effect, friend or foe, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's fundamental to survivability of our planet, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, these, these are their responses. Um, and so, I mean, we have to be careful with press in terms of supporting the thought that carbon dioxide is a pollution. Well, please, everyone, hold your breath, right? Carbon dioxide is a natural, important component to the Earth atmosphere system. Um, what we're talking about is an enhanced greenhouse effect, right? And that enhancement is an important part. And so I sort of approach, we need to understand the science, which it's complex, it's hard, it's difficult, and then let each individual decide in terms of the politics that goes beyond uh, that. <clears throat> and so where do greenhouse gases come from? Right, so this was this is a look at our middle school students. They did pretty well, right? Combination of both human and natural sources. <clears throat> now we compare with international population, right? This was the published study uh, from Boone, from the UK and Australian students, um, in terms of thinking about where, um, how do we change the amount of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere? And so the percent that you see is the percent of students that got it correct. Um, that the three answers um, that are highlighted in red were those that we did significantly poorly compared to the international students. And again, these are international students of the same age, 10 and 20 years prior to our West Virginia students answering these questions. So it's quite interesting. So following these same students, right, that I sampled in 2011, you see the N equals 44. I actually found 44 of them again in 2015. Um, you can see how their responses changed. So this is how, again, we impact the amount of greenhouse gases uh, by burning of oil, planting trees, expanding the ozone, which is a common misconception related uh, to climate change. Um, using alternative energy, insulating buildings and structures, and driving automobiles. Um, and you can compare our student responses and how they changed over time um, and those international population. So we didn't do better than our international counterpoints, right? Um, so that's with our past standards-based instruction. So maybe I can be optimistic, I don't know, uh, with our current standards. Unfortunately, they're a product of their educators, right? Um, and so um, working with educators, working with those who teach educators uh, to address this issue, I think is most paramount, uh, particularly at an institution of higher education, which is training and preparing uh, those future educators. Um, and so, you know, again, supporting all of the research, these are the primary uh, recommendations and, and where they had difficulty across the international. So my recommendations, right, it's important for it uh, to take place at more than one grade level. Um, and, you know, we, we call it a learning progression. And so it should be an issue that is faced uh, multiple times over the K-12 um, series um, with more and more complexity. 
And um, so we need to really focus on those aspects that are most commonly um, misunderstood. We call them misconceptions um, related uh, to these issues because our teachers hold those same misconceptions. And so that's being perpetuated, of course, in the classroom. But it's undoubtedly, we have to recognize where our students come from, right? And in West Virginia, we come from a really unique place. Um, because, you know, when these standards were put up for public comment, there were very few comments until, right, someone, someone made some changes to the standards language. And then suddenly we had, they put them out for comment again the second time and there were thousands of comments, thousands of hits, and we had the unfortunate opportunity to be in the national level press, right? Um, and I think this comment, um, which was a response to our changing the language of some of the standards, um, the Board of Education saw fit to soften the language of the standards. You know, these were standards that were, that we, I was on the committee. Um, each of the states provided feedback to those who were writing the science standards. It was a very slow and methodical process over a two year time frame. We had experts from all across West Virginia, um, both content as well as science educators, as well as other states as well, who are part of that writing team. Um, and so they were very well grounded in science as we currently know and understand it. Um, and so our Board of Education softened the language of several of the secondary science standards related to climate change. Um, in science education, we kind of relate this, wow, this feels a lot like evolution 20 years ago. Right? I mean, that was a big deal, and there was a lot of pushback and a lot of issues associated with it. Now, evolution just slid right in. Unfortunately, in 20 years, it might be too late for us to really consider a lot of climate change um, issues. And so I thought this was a, you know, a really nice, thoughtful comment in response to the issues that our state leaders had with the standards. And in terms of future, as, as Todd, as um, he mentioned, you know, this is where I hope to see is that we can better prepare our educators to understand these issues so that that in turn gets translated into the classroom um, with more clarity uh, so that we can increase, increase knowledge, even though that might not impact actions. Um, that's one, one level uh, that we can work with together on that. And, and lastly, I wanted to pull your, you know, point your attention to this recent documentary. I had the opportunity uh, for Seth Kramer, one of the directors, to come and speak to my elementary science methods. So I teach that course, how to teach science for elementary educators, and it was fascinating. Um, one I saw, he was in, he, the anthropologist is about uh, Susan Crate, who's a, a professor from George Mason, I think, um, in, in, in Virginia. Um, who studies cultural anthropology of places and, and communities that are impacted by climate change, right? Uh, she's spent a lot of time in Siberia, um, and the, there's you know, work of hers and community events that are featured in Siberia, as well as in the Andes, and as well as in the uh, islands, you know, Mal I think it was the Maldives. Um, that are very much impacted and you know, they're finding new islands to move to. Right, I mean, I mean, it's really amazing. Uh, but the documentary is really a non-traditional um, approach to it because it's really through the lens of her teenage daughter um, that goes with her to meet these communities and about how she talks about this issue with friends down the street that are the same age and who who talk about, I'm not sure, my parents don't really seem to believe in it. And so they talk about that in a really non-traditional way. Um, and so I just wanted to call your attention to that. So when I had Seth come into my class, he's like, I think what we do is a lot alike. We're trying to convince people who are kind of afraid of science that mm, this is something important and it's going, um, and we need to think about it. Um, even though we might not fully understand and have all the knowledge that's really difficult to achieve uh, for everyone, um, we need to still talk about it and it'll be a part of our consciousness. So anyway, I highly recommend, um, it's on Amazon Prime for anyone who's a member. Um, uh, so it's called The Anthropologist that just came out. Um, so if you have any questions, I am on Twitter. Tina Cartwright is my hashtag. So thank you. I need to say something about questions. I was told that, uh, that those were great questions. We had a good discussion from my point of view sitting here. It sounds pretty good. But several people said that some people in the audience said,
didn't hear the questions when they were asked. And there is a system, which I didn't know about, for writing on a card. And you've been handed a card, most people, uh, that you can write a question on. And there's, there's folks at the back of the room who will come and collect your card. You just wave it around, and pass it out to the end of the aisle, and they'll bring them down to me, and I'll sort of look through them a little bit, and maybe I can... That's not, that doesn't mean we won't call on people to put their hands up, but that might work better. So is that good? Did I say the right thing? Okay. Let's get, Amy, you're going to go next. You introduce yourself? All right. That's fine. Amy Hessel uh, is uh, one of West Virginia University's, I'll introduce her enough to say that, that she's uh, one of our uh, academic superstars and has uh, traveled many places in the world to uh, do paleoclimatology which is the reconstruction of past uh, climates uh, using uh, dendrology, uh, tree rings. And, but she's part of the, the larger community of paleoclimatologists who are involved in putting together understandings of the past climate, the relationship to things like these CO2 levels and all that. And with that, and she's got lots of, she's got a lab that's very cool, and a lot of her students are uh, all over the place. and. Uh, I'm sure the university is very proud of her. So, um, and she encouraged us when we started doing these programs five years ago. I, yeah, we met at a coffee shop yeah. and you said, yeah, go ahead, I'll, I'll come. <laughs> so it, I, we took her up on it. Amy Hessel. Thank you. So I'm really um, quite honored and humbled to follow on the previous speakers. Um, and as mentioned, uh, most of my work deals with looking at the last 2,000 years of climate variability using the rings of trees. Um, and so I've done work in Inner Asia, and I'm now working in Southern Australia and Tasmania, looking at past climate variability um, and how it relates to current extremes. So um, that's sort of my research interest. But what I'm gonna talk to you today, about today, is um, more how I've been teaching climate change in the classroom and giving presentations to local groups like Rotary Clubs and so forth. And um, over time, uh, so I've been here since 2001, and over time I've developed what I call the five slide slam dunk, which um, unfortunately isn't really a slam dunk, so, and I'll explain that. Um, I've basically developed like a very short presentation that I believe provides like the most important data. But as we saw from previous speakers, thank you very much, Dylan, um, what's interesting is that I can give this presentation to someone who's really, you know, a, a real denier, and they will get on board. But 20 minutes later, they've slid back. So there's something really interesting about that, and um, I'll, pr I'll provide you with this presentation anyway, and then I think it's some sort of food for discussion afterwards, like what happens there, right? Um, so I give this presentation also in, um, very, in different forms to my classes um, at the undergraduate level, so from freshmen all the way up to uh, graduate students who are in PhD programs. And my goal there is really to get people to the point where they can clearly communicate um, what the factual evidence is um, and be confident that they have the major pieces uh, put together in their minds so that when they have a conversation with someone, they can actually say, uh, well, this is the data, this is where you can see the data, and they can be confident about their explanation. So that's kind of my goal with this. So how are we so sure? And I actually think this is a fairly simple science. I don't think it takes um, you know, a highly educated person to understand this. I think it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, but I start off my presentation by showing people a graph like this with um, the y-axis removed. So, um, and I ask, do you think this is the Dow Jones? <laughs> could this be Earth's temperature? What, could it be pirates? Like, what is it? And then I just leave it, leave it there, okay? Um, then I'd like to address the following questions. So how is it that scientists are so sure about this? Do greenhouse gases warm the Earth? We can answer that. Are the greenhouse gases ours? Are temperatures actually getting warmer? Are human causes of warming more important than natural causes? And does this matter? It's perhaps the most important question for people. So we've known that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and it traps 
heat in the atmosphere. We've known this since at least 1861. This is John Tyndall's uh, instrument that he used to assess that. And of course, um, if there's any engineers in the audience, you might be, well, be aware of Jean-Baptiste Fourier and the Fourier transform. He was one of the first people to understand that there must be a role of the atmosphere in keeping Earth's temperature at a cozy 59 degrees on average. So we've known that for a long time. Are these gases increasing as a result of human activity? And we started measuring this, of course, in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s on Mauna Loa volcano. And we now have these uh, stations all over the world, right, where we can look at uh, the rise of CO2 in this example in the atmosphere. So increasing parts per million. We can also see the seasonal signal there where northern hemisphere um, ecosystems draw down CO2 when they're active and when those northern hemisphere ecosystems go dormant in the wintertime, we have a release of CO2 to the atmosphere. How do we know those greenhouse gases are ours? Well, the ones that we burn, the fossil fuels that we burn, actually have an isotopic signature that tells us uh, that, this, that these gases are ours. So at the same time, the total concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is going up. We have a special uh, chemical signature in the CO2 that tells us that the CO2 that we are burning is part of the increase. So ironically, uh, we see this level of delta 13C isotope going down as we increase the amount of old carbon that we're burning and putting into the atmosphere. So we know there's a chemical fingerprint there, so we can track that. Is Earth's temperature actually rising? This is the one that most people are aware of and we have confidence in, and I'm pretty certain most people are aware of this fact, right? We can see the global mean uh, temperature estimates based on, here we have a NASA GIS for uh, total uh, land and ocean temperatures rising since the 1880s up to present time. We can also see um, some interesting patterns in that data set where we have a flattening in the 1960s and 70s, um, and then the most recent El Nino event as the peak temperature um, last year. And then uh, we can also see the seasonal changes occurring globally. So where we, if we look at, uh, on the right-hand side there, if we look at the NASA GIS temperature from January to December, so we can see the seasonal cycle changing. The blue values are early in the record and the red values are going to 2018. Um, so we know that we're seeing a changing seasonal cycle. Uh, and are temperatures warmer than they have been recently? So we can look, and this is where my you know, research area is mostly placed. Um, so temperatures are now warmer than they have been in at least the last 1,500 years. So this is a combination of um, the instrumental data here for um, summertime, northern hemisphere summertime temperatures, May, June, July, and August in red, and a reconstruction of those temperatures um, from paleoclimate records, things like tree rings, ice cores, and uh, corals going back in time. And we can see that though there were periods when temperatures were warm, uh, relatively speaking, recent temperatures are pretty extreme and we're heading in a very, very quickly paced change towards warmer temperatures. So relative to the last 1500 years, so in the time that Western civilization has really developed, we see relatively stable conditions compared to now. Now there's some interesting deviations there that are worth talking about. So we can see um, these peaks in temperatures during the medieval times in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, right around the year 1000, there's like some peak temperatures there um, that may rival recent conditions, uh, but they are only the most extreme um, estimates rival current conditions. Um, and then we can see temperatures, uh, the lower temperatures of the 1700s and 1800s that we think of as the Little Ice Age, and this is when um, you know the Thames froze over and things like that. So the small changes in the past that are dwarfed by current change, those small changes actually had big impacts on societies. So during the medieval times, you could grow wine grapes in England, and there were, there were actually fairly large changes to um, social systems at that time, and as well as the um, cold temperatures during the Little Ice Age having some societal impacts. 
Uh, so the AR5 is a suite of uh, climate models. And so those are estimated temperatures based on climate models independent of actual paleoclimate data. So just how the model behaves based on what we know about natural variability in the climate system. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. It's a great question. Thank you. So getting back to our original slide, we can now see that that, in fact, was not the Dow Jones, but it is global change in uh, temperature anomalies. This is a series of figures that will illustrate that uh, our contributions to recent warming are major, given what we know about the climate system and its natural variability. Um, so this was produced by Ed Hawkins, who's at the National Center for Atmospheric Science um, at the University of Reading in the UK, and he's also an AP IPCC AR5 um, contributing author. And he's got this great series that explains how we know that things like changes in the sunspot cycle or El Nino or um, longer term changes like um, uh, planetary geometry, like how those things are important, but not in this particular case. So here we have the model estimates based on um, only natural forcing. So everything we know about how the atmosphere works and its natural variability. And there's some interesting little um, dips in that. Those are some recent eruptions you might recognize, uh, Mount Pinatubo and so forth. And you can see the temperature decrease during those events in the past. So we have things like volcanic eruptions included here. But it's, we can't represent the change in recent temperature just given this natural forcing. If we add the natural forcing plus the anthropogenic forcing, then our models become much closer to reality. So the reality being that black line, which is the actual temperature of Earth. Um, and so we have a much better estimate if we include the anthropogenic forcing with the natural forcing. So does it matter? So that's the most important question for us to decide as individuals and as a society as a society. Um, so if we don't reduce emissions, we can expect the planet to warm about 9 degrees C by 2100, or sorry, 9 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. So this is the forecast, um, and there's some variations in that, those estimates. Um, but one of the things I like to tell students is that if, and I don't have the slide for this here, but the, the big change in our estimates of future temperature is actually what we do. So that's the most important source of uncertainty is what we decide to do about CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So the ending question, of course, is, is if it's real, why haven't we done anything? And this is the uh, topic that is of most interest to me when I'm talking to young people. So particularly freshmen, 18, 19 year old students. Um, this is, I think, after they finish seeing this presentation, they're like, well, gosh, why haven't we done anything about this? And this is where we can come back again to the Dow Jones. So interestingly enough, if you compare the Dow Jones Industrial Average to temperature change, it's remarkably similar, right? And though I don't want to say, like, OK, exact correlation, but there's been a number of studies um, looking at you know, GDP and CO2 emissions, for example. They're tightly coupled, um, and there's a good reason for that. And I think it also explains to some extent why um, it's so difficult to make progress. So like a lot of us are sort of pointing fingers at the oil and gas industry. And yes, they've been like very guilty perpetrators, much like the tobacco industry, you know, that perjured themselves before Congress, right? It's a very similar phenomenon. But it's a much bigger problem than just the oil and gas industry. It's actually industry, period because it takes carbon and energy to make anything. So when we point fingers at a particular group, it's actually maybe not quite seeing the whole picture. Um, and so I just want to follow up with the most recent um, special report on climate change that the IPCC issued in um, October. Um, and so this is where they were looking at what is it going to take? What are, what are the effects of keeping temperatures at 1.5 degrees C above um, pre-industrial levels versus two degrees C above industrial levels. Um, and the, I think the most important take-home message there from that report 
is about the carbon budget. And I think it's useful to kind of go along with the financial model, thinking about the Dow Jones and thinking about budgeting, um, to look at what we need to do to keep temperatures at one and a half degrees C, temperature rise. So uh, we have to have net zero emissions by 2055. That's soon. That's, you know, in our lifetime. We're not talking about 2100 anymore, right? We're talking about 2055. We have a remaining budget of 580 gigatons of CO2 that if we don't want to overshoot 1.5 degrees C, that's what we have left to spend. Currently, we're burning CO2 at a rate of 42 gigatons of CO2 per year. So who's good with the quick calculations? Yeah, so we have 14 years at our current rate. So 14 years to make a decision about what we're gonna do. We don't even have that. We, we really need to make the decision now, right? But I think it brings home this message that um, we're not talking about what my colleague calls Coke Zero solutions, right? So Coke Zero is like, it tastes really good and it doesn't really cost you anything to drink it, right? It's like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> no calories, no, does it have ca caffeine, no sugar? <laughs> caffeine, no sugar? Huh? How much are they paying you to taste it? Coke Zero? <laughs> so the problem with Coke Zero, though, is that you don't actually get the thing. You know, you don't get the Coke. So um, we, don't have, we don't have Coke Zero s solutions here. We need like serious solutions, and that's something that, um, that I also practice with my students. So we go through a whole semester of, of talking about past climate variability, current change, how do we know these things? And then the end of the semester, they spend two weeks coming up with solutions. And that's perhaps the most interesting part of uh, that particular class, is that they have to actually make some back of the envelope calculations about what it would take to get to net zero. How much solar exactly does it take? And I think that's the real awakening, even for students who are on board with this, is the level of change that's required. Um, and so we're not talking about um, small changes. And so that gets back to why it's been so difficult for us to take action. But I do wanna leave on a positive note, and I do this with my class also. So I just would like to say that um, Getting to net zero by 2055 seems really intimidating, um, but we should remember that any emissions reductions are good because it's not just about 1.5. It's, you know, we might miss 1.5. We might get to two. We might get to 2.5. We might get to five, but any reductions are gonna be good. All solutions are on the table. Um, and I think that's really important to consider and taken me a while as like sort of a rabid environmentalist, you know, when I was like 20 to get to the, to the position now where I, I do believe that any, any solution is on the table. Um, also challenges promote innovation. And I think this has been said already and it's really important to recognize that. Um, and certainly for this state in particular, um, these challenges could really provide some excellent opportunities for the state um, and there's so much opportunity in change. Less opportunity in staying the same, but way more opportunity in change. So I'll just finish with that and uh, answer any questions uh, from the panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Randy. Um, I hope you got a... PowerPoint you're going to use? Okay. Uh, yeah, I already put it up. Uh, while she's doing that, she's got, I, um, I think Brandy was a student of Nick Zegg up here, weren't you? Yeah. So, um, Another cool lab, uh, climate conscious lab up here is run by a hydrology professor named Nicholas Zegg, who has uh, sent a lot of folks out into the world teaching and researching and doing all sorts of other things. Uh, but he really gets climate in a good way. And Brandy has been working specifically on hydrology, and she's a uh, and and she's now teaching at Alderson Broadus University down in Philippi. She's my neighbor in, in that area, and uh, she pre you presented at one of our conferences on the impacts of climate change in the Highlands and mm -hmm. talked about your research there. I remember that, 
So I assume she's going to talk a little bit about that and also about her experiences now as a, as a teacher dealing with the climate change topic. Yep. Thank you. All right, thank you for that introduction. Yeah. Um, so before I start, uh, I do want to clarify what I'm going to be talking about. Turn on the microphone a little bit more. Um, Good. Okay. So what I want to talk about is how to teach climate change in the classroom so that students can see the data on their own. Instead of telling students what's happening, I like the students to figure it out on their own. And I do this through a sort of new concept called active learning, where the students are actually engaging with the material instead of me showing them graphs and being like, you know, carbon dioxide has increased a lot. I ask them, look at this graph. How much is climate change, how much is CO2 increasing? What's it doing? What do you think that means? Where does it come from? Talk to your group. Come up with some ideas. Come up with some solutions. And so a large portion of my class every day is me asking students, what do they think, instead of me telling students what I think. <laughs> and um, there's some caveats to this, so you can't get through as much material. Um, but there's a lot of benefits in that students actually remember what they learn and they like it because they're not bored. They're sitting in class and they're doing stuff and um, I'll have uh, like one, I'll have like one PowerPoint where I'm actually explaining some material because I do need to actually tell them stuff. Um, and then I'll give them some time to work. So it's about every five to seven minutes they're doing something. And um, this works because in these new generations, there's research research that we have like a attention span, le literally less than a goldfish. So, and I see it. I actually see it. Because if I go longer than five minutes, they're like, what's going on? I'm bored. So um, what I want to do today is um, not necessarily tell you that climate change is changing you know, that global warming is happening. But um, I want you to sort of interact with how our atmosphere works. What part of the atmosphere um, do you think is changing? And then we're gonna um, come back and we're gonna talk about it. And um, another thing I like to do in my classroom is have all different kind of technology. So um, students, I, I actually, I, I don't let them use their cell phones. I want them to use their hand, hands to write because research also shows that when they're writing as opposed to typing, they actually do learn more. Something about that kinesthetic movement um, sort of takes this like hot hand-eye coordination and actually puts it into their long-term memory. But um, I like videos and I like movies and I like clips. And so what I'm going to do today is um, show you some movies and some moving objects on my PowerPoint so that it can go into your, um, your visual memory and maybe sort of stay there for a little bit. And uh, you just use different ways to illustrate climate change instead of just graphs and um, tables and these things that my students absolutely won't remember in eight seconds. Um, Analogies, that's another thing. Um, I use a lot of analogies and students tend to like that. Um, so now that I'm gonna get started, um, do really start doing some research, please, if, if you're a faculty member, um, start thinking about this, this theory of active learning. It's, it's actually implementing the material and having the students interact with, their, uh, with the data. Okay, so the first thing, um, like I said, I talk about my, my PowerPoint. And then I, I allow students to interact. We have some papers that are going to be passed around. Um, can, you, can you girls go ahead and do that for me? Thank you so much. Um, I realize that we don't have tables. So the, there will be questions that I'll have you interact with the material in a little bit. If you can't write on it, just get out your cell phone and type it. Or if you have a computer, type it. When we get to this, um, know that it's a, it's a, a group thing. So talk to your neighbor and sort of talk about climate change with each other instead of using, I, want, I definitely want some communication and noise when we get to that. So we have two girls that will be passing out uh, papers, unless you've already gotten them. Um, so I have to stay here because my voice isn't very loud. So the first thing is we know that Earth is a greenhouse planet. As Amy said, um, or Somebody said, uh, we know that greenhouse gases are good. We know that they're great for our planet, but it's just really we're exacerbating this. And any, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Um, and so our atmosphere is really very complex. 
Um, and it's based on this energy cap, this heat capture system through greenhouse gases. And I sort of like to use it as an analogy from, um, as a car. So the thing that most, almost everybody in America has, probably has multiple as a car. Raise your hand if in the summer you ever opened the door and it was like heat just wafted out at you. So that's how, yeah, that's what our atmosphere is like. We have, in the analogy of a car, we have sunlight coming through our atmosphere. And then once it gets through our atmosphere, gets under Earth, it, it sort of changes. And once it goes back out into the atmosphere, it's stuck. And that's exactly what happens in a car. When light comes through our windshield, it sort of changes. Once it gets into our car, that new energy is stuck in our car. And that's why it gets so hot in our car, because once it gets through the windshield, it, it changes, and it can't escape again. So it gets so hot in our car, same thing with our atmosphere. We have what's called uh, shortwave radiation that comes from the sun, goes to our atmosphere, changes a little bit once it gets to Earth and reflects. And then our greenhouse gases absorb all of that heat and keep that energy and that heat in our, um, in our atmosphere. And it makes Earth a wonderful place to live, obviously, if, if too much of a good thing doesn't become a bad thing. So knowing this, and knowing that that is a super simple explanation for something that I don't even think know that scientists know the exact complexities of it. There's atmosphere is extremely complex. Let's talk about actually what happens in the atmosphere. So this is what it looks like. Do you know? Do we have a? Um, do we have like a laser pointer? Oh, okay. Great. Okay. So what? Um, what I want to do now is I want to talk to you about actually how our atmosphere works and where, where uh, these greenhouse gases are working. I'm not going to tell you where the greenhouse gases are working. I'm going to tell you how this works, and then I want you to think where the greenhouse gas is working, and this is where the teamwork thing is going to come in. So first we have the sun, which is the yellow. Can't really see it. Um, the sun is yellow. 100% of our energy comes from the sun. Each of these numbers that we're seeing here is a percentage. Um, something really interesting about Earth that's a little bit different than some other planets is that we're an equal energy flux planet. So all of the energy that we get actually eventually will go back out into space. So all of these numbers add up to 100. You can see the exact inputs and outputs. So we have 100% of energy that comes from the sun. Uh, we have 23% right here that's absorbed by the atmosphere before it, even gets, uh, before it even gets to Earth. This is the kind of energy, for example, the ozone layer will, will absorb. And the UV, the UV rays that, that the ozone is protecting us from are our very good friend, the ozone layer, among other things. Um, and then we have 46% here that's absorbed by Earth. That's the heat that we can feel from Earth. Who's ever felt a rock in the sun? in the summer and it's kind of, it's pretty warm. Anybody felt a warm rock in the sun in the summer? Yeah, so that's 46% here that's absorbed by Earth. And then we have 25% um, here that's reflected from clouds. So that's before it even gets to Earth. Sunlight hits clouds, it's reflected up. Never even gets to Earth. And then we have this really important 6% right here that's reflected from the surface. Um, and this is reflected from our snow, and, more, and white snow reflects more energy. And white snow does something that's really interesting in that it reflects energy. Who's ever, who's ever had a white t-shirt on in the summer and, and noticeably felt that it's cooler than where, when you wear a black t-shirt? So it, it's the same with snow. So when we have our white t-shirt on, when we have our white snow, when we have white snow, energy is being reflected. And when that snow melts, it's starting, starting to show that dark soil underneath, and that's absorbing more heat. And so over time, as our Arctic um, snow and other places starts to melt, this number might shift a little bit. But for now, this is how it is. It's a very important number, and can contribute to climate change in a feedback system. Um, 
So, okay, so these numbers all add up to 100. We have 100% of energy from the sun, 23 is absorbed by the atmosphere from the U, uh, ozone layer and other things before it even gets to Earth. 46% is absorbed by Earth, our hot rocks. 25 is reflected from the um, clouds, goes back into the atmosphere, never even hits Earth. And then 6% is reflected from white stuff. 23, 46, 25, 6, all add up to that 100, okay? So we have 100% here. All of that energy does something in these little arrows that come off of this big yellow arrow. Of this 46% that's absorbed by Earth, this part that's absorbed by Earth, the 46%, is that basically um, that heat in your car. So we have 46% that um, goes back out into these red arrows right here. 37 plus 9 equals 46. So 46 goes like this, and it's absorbed by the atmosphere, or, and it's emitted back out into space. These little red arrows are the heat in our car. They get to Earth, they're absorbed by Earth, they're reflected in a different energy that's, that gets stuck in the atmosphere. So um, I'm going to go through that one more time. So one thing that um, I've noticed from teaching is that um, you think that it sounds pretty, pretty easy, but then my students are like, I have no idea what you just said. So I'm going to go through it one more time. We have 100% of energy from the sun. 23 is absorbed by the atmosphere. That's our ozone layer, other things. 46% is absorbed by Earth, our hot rocks in the sun. 25 is reflected from clouds before it even gets to Earth. 6% is reflected from white stuff. Of this 46% here, it goes into Earth and is reflected back out and gets stuck in our car. It's our, the hot air in our car. And then um, some can get stuck in our atmosphere and some can just go right back out into space. It can make it through all of our clouds. It can make it through the four layers of our atmosphere, and it can just go straight at, back out into space and be like, see you, bye. So now what I want you to do is use those numbers I just gave you. Talk to your group. If you're sitting by yourself, get up, please, and, and sit beside somebody else. This shouldn't be an individual thing. Meet some new people. And I want you to answer the questions on your sheet. Should be these. What are the energy inputs and outputs? Where does our energy come from? Where does it go? How does those numbers I just tell you add up to 100? So we know that 100% of our energy comes from the sun. How does the where the energy go add back up to that 100%? You have two separate calculations here. You have your 100% from the arrow, and it's these four. And then you have a separate set of the amount of energy um, that comes from the Earth and where that reflected energy from the Earth goes. So how does our energy inputs in the atmosphere add up to 100, right? And then once you've understood this schematic, so you need to start with something, something easy, right? We, where does the energy come from? Where does it go? No numbers. And then how do these numbers add up? And then really start analyzing the schematic and think if, well, increasing the greenhouse gases affects what part of the schematic. So what part of this energy balance keeps the earth warm? So we have this arrow, this arrow, this arrow, this arrow. So we have six arrows, right? Which one of these arrows are responsible for climate change? Yeah. That's because we didn't talk about that. Um, that sort of goes, uh, that, that, remember when I said that Earth is a really interesting planet in that we have uh, um, equal uh, flow of energy. We have the same amount of energy that comes into Earth, and then that amount of energy is reflected back into space, essentially. So all of these arrows that um, go back out into space, so you see how the arrows are like, um, like faded here, and then at some point they get dark. Those are, that's all of the energy that's essentially reflected back out into space. Eventually, you have 60 plus 9 plus 6 plus 25 will equal all of the amount of energy that's emitted back out into space. 
So for the purposes of this, uh, please do just ignore all of the, all of, just ignore this, um, this part here that says emitted back the 60%, just ignore that for now. So for now, what, we, what I want you to do is I want you to analyze the part that I told you about. So 100% of energy is coming from the sun, 23% is absorbed by the atmosphere, and then you have these um, arrows. Talk to your group. I'm going to walk around, and I'm going to talk to people and see if you're on the right track. I don't have much time, no. So um, this might go five fast. Minutes. Five minutes. You have five minutes to do this. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I'm done. All right, so that, um, that, that's, amount, that's all the time we have. Know that when it comes to something this complex, I leave about 20 minutes in my class for the students to work through this. And I have a small class size. I only have 15 to 30 people in my class, so I can walk around and I can talk to everybody. Um, so know that having five minutes isn't enough. But um, eventually, you know, these students can really start to interact with this material and understand how the atmosphere works. Is on a very, on a very specific level, understand where greenhouse gases um, are affecting our atmosphere. And so, um, to answer your last question, what I really want my students to get to is to understand that. Um, greenhouse gases are impacting the percentage of energy that is absorbed by our atmosphere. It's our greenhouse gases and it's, it's absorbing more of the energy in our atmosphere and it's keeping our, our, our globe um, warmer. Um, that's all I have, but um, if you are a faculty member and you, and you present to your classroom, um, do keep in mind that you can just have them teach themselves. And it, it, really, it really makes it easier for, for you on this end because then you're not talking for 15 minutes. Um, if there are questions, we have to answer them later. But um, it was wonderful talking to you. And sorry, um, sorry I, I went so long. That was fabulous. Thank you, Brandy. OK, um, she's putting up a, um, a, a, a hashtag for the National Energy Conference while I'm doing this. I'll just say um, I got my. Questions, pass them in. I've already got three up here so far. Uh, I'm going to ask them. Barry, you got what you going in writing? Okay, hold on. Let me get with these compliant people here. Uh, try to honor their compliance. Um, <laughs> thank you. A couple more. Um, by the way, uh, we, I've alluded several times to the fact that uh, Friends of Blackwater and our Climate Change and Impacts Initiative has been doing these kitchen climate science programs that. Uh, We've, we've created three-dimensional models using colored rice grains and tennis balls, and they're all out in the hall there, and there's a teacher's manual, actually, which is, goes on forever, but uh, it, it, it does contain the, the, the basics of how you can show this, a lot of this stuff in three dimensions, and nothing like being a photon and traveling from the sun to the earth and back and getting trapped by the greenhouse gases. I mean, this is some fun stuff, and uh, kids like to do it in classrooms. So uh, when I read this stuff, I say, oh, we need to get up. And, and then when we get them to dance the greenhouse boogie, that's the best. <laughs> All right. Um, here's a, a question. Uh, first question, How can we, any thoughts on how West Virginia residents can uh, impact their boards of education, county boards, to improve their climate change curricula. Any experience? You, you, you might have a good insight on that. Um, well, my brother-in-law just recently ran and was elected to my local speak Board of Education. Up, speak up a little bit. Um, I think that's challenging. Um, probably working through, um, Amy just mentioned that they're um, in our recently adopted 2016 um, curriculum, we now have a ninth grade earth and space science course um, that's required of all high school students. Um, unfortunately, we're a little slower to respond to needs at the higher education level in terms of providing adequate training and depth of content that they would have t needed in, in their college curriculum. Um, and so, Fairmont State, WVU, and Marshall, we're trying to put forth an earth and space science certification. Uh, but unfortunately, not all of the teachers that are teaching this course have had a real depth experience or maybe even any class in meteorology or climatology uh, prior to teaching this course now. 
Um, and so working with those teachers, reaching out to those teachers who I think teachers recognize their own deficiencies in understanding, and oftentimes that translates into avoidance, right? Um, they just sort of avoid the topic or assign students to read the chapter and, you know, how, the, how well that goes. Um, and, and so really reaching out, working first at, with your local educators um, is how I highly recommend um, in terms of impacting your local, local level. The school board is another matter and outside of my wheelhouse. All right, I, I want to just add to that. There are several uh, climate groups in West Virginia that are now uh, doing programs in schools that with, in cooperation with their uh, local school board, uh, climate education using citizen volunteers. And, you know, it, it sometimes it gets pushed back, but sometimes it's quite successful. At Parkersburg, they've been doing it a, a bunch, a bunch. Um, the, the next question here, uh, Amy, uh, we got a quick question. Is that... Uh, C13 or 14C that is depleted due to radioactive decay? I had to ask that question. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, the old carbon has, you know, fossil fuel carbon is really old, right? So it's had a longer time period to decay, so it tends to be lighter. I isotopically think. so yeah, yeah. that's so it, the, it, the stuff that, that's like moving around in the atmosphere all the time is younger, right? So it's heavier uh -huh. um, so that's why we see that change. Yeah. So, so, so this uh, carbon that I've accumulated is, uh, in, uh, in me since uh, 310, when my cohort, uh, yeah, is that old carbon or new carbon? Uh, that would be new. All right. Newer, I, I right? New carbon. Yeah. Oh, but I, yeah. I picked so up some. You have that. I probably have on. some of that old carbon in, in me. Is that what you're saying? No. I mean, I probably do. Yeah, yeah you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, does, Amy, did you ever discuss geoengineering with your students? And you as a um, meteorologist also might. Oh, yeah, that's on. a really great question. So geoengineering is something that I've always, like, sort of recoiled from, right? But, um, but I do have this policy in my class and for myself that, um, that all options are on the table. So I think, you know, it's really important for students when, to Why don't you just say stay. what geoengineering is? Maybe so, some people don't know it. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's somebody else who's better at explaining what that is than me. But, um, yeah, these are like uh, engineered solutions to climate change. So it could be like um, how can we break down CO2 into carbon monoxide and... Um, oxygen, or how can we sort of vacuum up, you know, the CO2 that's in the atmosphere, things like that. So, so, yeah, yeah. seeding, yeah. yeah. So, th that, again, that Im immediately draws to mind our recently adopted next generation science standards now require our teachers to implement and incorporate engineering into their instruction at every grade level in science. So, they have engineering expectations, um, which was brand new, right? I mean, it came. For those of us in the science world, felt like it came out of like, what? Um, but so that means, again, our teachers are underprepared in terms of presenting that to their students, um, understanding it themselves. Um, so that, again, is another avenue of reach that you can sort of reach out to your teachers in terms of, you know, I can help you with those engineering and technology standards that now are part of your curriculum that they've probably had very little prior expertise um, and experience incorporated in instruction. So it's another sort of avenue of entry into working and collaborating with your local educators. Yeah, we're going to hear some from some engineers this afternoon, actually, who are working on uh, reducing methane emissions here uh, this afternoon from WVU. And uh, let's see, Perry. I'm going to call him Perry. He's yeah, hands up here. Uh, yeah, I mean, or Tina might be a better person to answer that. Oh, you, golly, geez. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a slow process, right? So the carbon cycle, the active carbon cycle is pretty slow. Um, so unlike, um, so, uh, unlike the uh, chemicals that break down the ozone layer that we've been pretty effective at dealing with, um, it's going to take a lot longer for CO2 to be sort of taken up, absorbed by the oceans, for example. So yeah, it's a longer term, hundreds of years at a minimum. Here's somebody, I got to, yeah, this person here. Uh, yeah, uh, Jesse Burke. Speak up. Dr. Heckel, <laughs> uh, it, it, I agree with you mostly, um, but the 1970s were a time of wrenching change. When you go out to your car, the standards of your car is based on the technology that the companies have to make solutions in OPEC and Bio. 
So, um, so what's your, I'm not, I don't totally understand what the case you're making is. Uh, can you become more efficient, uh, uh, car is cheap, safety is Yeah. Right? Even though it's a 55. Right. Now, I remember it being in line for gas, you know, as a kid, well, so. Well, yeah. Well, there's some people here who just uh, gleam in somebody's eye in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, um, so I don't know. My, my view of this is uh, that we've made minimal, you know, we've really made minimal um, efforts to deal with this problem so you, far. I, gotta, I want to follow up on something several people have said here about mm -hmm. the, 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 this question here. Um, said, I just met science teachers, science teachers at the West Virginia Science Teachers Association, and uh, they said that a number of people had said they were really afraid to t still to talk about climate change mm -hmm. in their classroom. And so, uh, you know, if what you got any advice for those teachers? Uh, or any thoughts about uh, about that, about how people deal with that? Because it's real uh, for lots of reasons, and it, it's it's not something to, to put down. It has to be addressed, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, the number, the sort of the number of like um, people, even in a large lecture class of like 350, when I first started teaching in 2001, I would occasionally get someone who would just really heckle me. Um, but that's pretty much gone away, so I can't speak to what it's like in the like K through 12. Um, I think it might be a little harder, um, but um, I just, I mean, I'm a scientist, so I just always go back to the data, and I encourage them to, to bring their own data to the table, so, but that's, you know. Any thoughts, Brandy? You're, you're teaching all just and broad, you're seeing undergraduates, young, pretty young people just out of high school. You know, for, for some people, is this, uh, do you feel uh, a little concerned, like maybe I might offend somebody here, or am I? Well, um, I actually, I teach climate change to non-majors, to elementary eds, actually, and um, I, I actually just, I was just telling somebody, I just actually gave a climate change um, lecture to that class this weekend, and I always ask them at some point, what, do you believe in climate change? And... Um, and they all said yes. It's a pretty small class, but it's like and they all said yes. But then I said, well, do you know somebody that doesn't believe in climate change? And um, two or three people said they did. And, um, and it was very interesting, though, because they told me in the context that they have arguments with these people about climate change, like it's, it's happening. And so they're, they're constantly engaging, or they're usually family members, they're engaging with their family members about climate change and arguing that it's an important issue. And um, I sort of followed up with that, and I said to all of your elementary ed majors, this is a really important topic, and you, you need to understand it so that you can inform this new generation because this is an intergenerational problem, and we're going to be the problem solvers. My, my generation will probably be the problem solvers. And um, then they're, you know, teaching another generation of problem solvers. And so my hope is that I can teach them so that they believe it, like Amy said, to their core enough that, they, that they're like, kind of like, I'm a scientist and I don't care if I offend people because this is a problem and I want to tell everybody about it. And they seem to be, <laughs> thank you. Brandy, let, let me follow up on that for just a second, because we're going to have to head for the lunchroom. Um, I, I want to say that having you know been in front of uh, quite a few hundred students, high school students, talking about, not in science clubs, in the HISTA clubs, um, I, the thing I thought I developed spontaneously, and, and now it's part of my repertoire, well, why don't I play the banjo? They tend to like that, and that's helpful. <laughs> uh, so if you see me with a banjo at lunchtime, watch out. 
And two, uh, I apologize. Uh, you know, as an old guy, I can do that maybe more credibly. But I frankly think that, uh, you know, we blew it. Uh, my generation and the folks, uh, you know, us folks, when we were back at 310 when I was born, and the people in front of us, who knew? I mean, it was inadvertent, but we created a real mess. And uh, it's not their fault uh, that, that, that we've created this mess. And I think that when they, you know, I don't like to hear arrogant science. Why don't you follow the science? How, because it's difficult. Because who knew? There, is a down, there are downsides to science, and when scientists acknowledge those, I mean, scientists created the nuclear bomb as well as nuclear energy. You know? And so when apologies go, go a long way to opening people's hearts to understanding, in my opinion, for young people anyhow, uh, and uh, for a lot of ignorant older people who didn't realize what the heck they were, we've been doing for a while. So I, I offer that uh, ad advice that uh, leading with an apology and, uh, and under it, it can be very helpful. Are we ready to go, Jamie? You want to say anything to everybody? Yes. Um, lunch is going to be down the hall, the major event stage, event hall. We're going to have two buffet lines. There's a line in the lobby, and then there's also a line in the event hall stage. So grab your food, and then we've got tables for you know, even 25 people or so. And then we're going to hear from Emily for our after uh, half hour for lunch and get her sign up. So if, even if you didn't sign up for lunch, there's lunch for you, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Very good. Thank you. Thanks to this panel. Thanks to this audience.